having me. So thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, look forward to talking about the SpaceX um, Mars architecture. And what, what I really want to try to uh, achieve here is to make Mars seem possible, uh, make it seem as though it's something that we can do in our lifetimes, um, and that you can go. And, and is there really a way that, that anyone could go if they wanted to? I think that's, that's really the important thing. So. I mean, first of all, why go anywhere, right? Um, the, I, I think th there, there are really two fundamental paths. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One, one, one path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. Um, I, I don't have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but there's, it's eventually history suggests there will be some, some doomsday event. Uh, the alternative is to become a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species, which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. Yes? <laughs> That's what we want. Yeah. So how do we figure out how to how to take you to Mars um, and, and create a, a self-sustaining city, a, a city that um, is not merely an outpost but could become a planet in its own right um, and for us, thus we could become a truly multi-planet species. Uh, there, there, you know, sometimes people wonder, well, what about other places in the solar system? Why, why Mars? Um, well, um, just to sort of put things into perspective, this is this is what this is an actual scale of what the solar system looks like. So we're we're currently in the, the third little rock from the left. Uh, that's Earth. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The and and our goal is to go to the fourth rock on the left. Uh, that's Mars. Um, but you can get a sense for the real scale of the solar system: how big the Sun is, and Jupiter, um, Neptune. Saturn, Uranus, and then the little guys on, on the right are Pluto and friends. This, this sort of uh, helps see it not, not quite to scale, but it gives you a better sense for, for where things are. Uh, so our options for, for, going to, for, for becoming a multi-planet species within our solar system are, uh, are limited. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of nearby options, we've, we've got Venus, uh, but Venus is a high pressure, a su super high pressure hot acid bath. Um, so that, that would be a tricky one. Uh, Venus is not at all like um, the, the, the goddess. This is not in no way similar to, to, to the actual goddess. Um, so it's really difficult to make things work on Venus. Uh, Mercury is also way too close to the sun. Um, we could go potentially on, the Mar one, of the, on the, one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but those are quite far out, much further from the sun, a lot harder to get to. It really leaves us with one option if we want to become a multi-planet civilization, and that's, that's Mars. Uh, we could conceivably go to our moon, um, and I certainly have nothing against going to the moon, but I think it's, it's challenging to create a, uh, become multi-planetary on the moon because it's, it's much smaller than, than, than a planet. Uh, it doesn't have any atmosphere. It, it's not as resource rich as Mars. Um, it's got a 28 day day, whereas the Mars day is 24 and a half hours. Um, and it, in general, Mars is, is far better suited to ultimately scale up to be a self sustaining civilization. So, just to give some uh, comparison between the, uh, the, the, the two planets, um, that they're actually fairly, they're remarkably close in a lot of ways. In, in fact, um, we now believe that, that early Mars was a lot like Earth. And in fact, if we could warm Mars up, we would once again have a thick, a thick atmosphere and liquid oceans. So but where, where things are right now, Mars is, Mars is about half again as far from the sun as, as Earth. Uh, so still decent sunlight. Um, it, it's a little cold, uh, but we can warm it up. Um, it has a, a very helpful atmosphere, which 
In the case of Mars being uh, primarily CO2 with some nitrogen and argon and a few other trace elements, means that we can grow plants on Mars just by compressing the atmosphere. Um, and, uh, so and it has nitrogen too, which is also very important for, for growing plants. Um, it would be quite fun to be on Mars because you'd have gravity, which is about 37% uh, that of Earth. Uh, so you'd be able to lift heavy things and bound around and like, have a lot of fun. Um, and the, the day is remarkably close to that of, of Earth. And um, so we just need to change that bottom row. Because currently we have 7 billion people on Earth and zero on Mars. So there's, there's been a lot of great work um, by NASA and, and, and other organizations in early exploration of Mars and understanding uh, the, what, what Mars is like, where could we land, what's the composition of, of, the, of the atmosphere, where, where is there water, um, order ice, I should say. And, and so uh, but we need to go from these early exploration missions to actually building a city. The, the issue that we have today is that if you look at a Venn diagram, uh, we, the, there's, there's, there's no intersection of sets of people who want to go and, and can afford to go. Um, it, in fact, right now, you cannot go to Mars for infinite money. Uh, using traditional methods, uh, you know, if, if taking sort of a Apollo-style approach, um, the, an optimistic cost number would be about $10 billion a person. So, for, for example, the Apollo program, uh, the cost estimates are somewhere between uh, 100 to $200 billion in current, current year dollars. Um, and we sent 12 people to the surface of the moon, which was an incredible thing and I think probably the, one of the greatest uh, achievements of, of humanity. Um, but but that's, that is a, a steep price to pay for a ticket. Um, that's why these circles only just barely touch. Um, so you, you can't create a self-sustaining civilization if the ticket price is $10 billion a person. What we need is a closer, is to move those circles together. And if we can get a co the cost of moving to Mars to be roughly equivalent to a median house price um, in, in the US, uh, which is around $200,000, then I think the probability of establishing a self-sustaining civilization is very high. I think it, I think it would almost certainly occur not, not everyone would want to go. In fact, I think a relatively small number of people from Earth would want to go, uh, but enough would want to go and who could afford the trip that it would happen. And you think people could get sponsorship, um, and, and I think it gets to the point where, where almost anyone, if they saved up and, and this was their goal, um, they, they could ultimately save up enough money to, to buy a ticket and move to Mars. Um, and Mars would have a labor shortage for a long time, so jobs would not be in short supply. So it is a bit tricky um, because we have to figure out how to improve the cost of trips to Mars by 5 million percent. Um, so this is, this is not easy. Um, and, I mean, it's, and it sounds like virtually impossible, but I, I, think, I think there are ways to do it. This, it's, this translates to an improvement of approximately four and a half orders of magnitude. These are the key elements that are needed in order to uh, achieve the four and a half order of magnitude improvement. Most of the, the improvement would come from full reusability, somewhere between two and two and a half orders of magnitude. And then the other two orders of magnitude would come from refilling in orbit, uh, propellant production on Mars, and choosing the right propellant. So I'm gonna go into detail on all those. Full reusability is, is, is really the, the, the super hard one. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to achieve uh, reusability for, for even an orbital system, um, and that challenge becomes even you know, substantially greater for a system that has to go to another planet. Um, but as an example of the difference between reusability and expendability in aircraft, and this you could actually use any form of transport, you could say a car, bicycle, horse, um, if they were single use, almost no one would use them, it'd be too expensive. Um, but with, with, with frequent flights, you can take something like that, uh, an aircraft that costs $90 million, um, and uh, if it was single use, you'd have to pay half a million dollars per flight. 
Um, but you can actually buy a ticket on Southwest right now um, from LA to Vegas for $43, including taxes. So that's, I mean, that's a massive improvement. Right there, it's, it's, it's showing a forward order of magnitude improvement. Now this is harder, the reusability doesn't apply quite as much to Mars because the number of times they can reuse the, the spaceship is, it, it, the spaceship part of the system is left less often because the Earth-Mars rendezvous only occurs every, every 26 months. So you get to use the spaceship part roughly every two years. Now you get to use the, the booster um, and the tanker as frequently as you'd like. Um, uh, and so you, it, it makes, that, that's why it really makes a lot of sense to, to load the spaceship into orbit with essentially tanks dry and have it have really quite big tanks that you then uh, use the booster and tanker to refill while it's in orbit and maximize the, the payload of, of, the, of the spaceship so that when it goes to Mars, it, you, you really have a very large uh, payload capability. So, as I said, refilling in orbit is, is one of the essential elements of this. Um, with, without refilling in orbit, you, um, you would have a half order of magnitude uh, impact roughly on, on the cost. Um, by half order of magnitude, I think the audience mostly knows, but what that means is each, each order of magnitude is a factor of 10. So um, not, ref, not refilling in orbit uh, would mean a 500% roughly increase in the cost per ticket. Um, it, it also allows us to, to build a smaller vehicle and uh, lower the development cost, although this vehicle is quite big, but it would be much harder to build something that's five to ten times the size. Um, and um, it, it also reduces the sensitivity of performance characteristics of the, of the booster rocket and, and tanker. So if there's a shortfall in uh, the performance of, of any of the elements, you can actually make up for it by having uh, one or two extra uh, refilling trips uh, to the spaceship. So this is it's very important for reducing the susceptibility of the system to a performance shortfall. And then uh, producing propellants on, on Mars is uh, actually you know, also very obviously important. Again, if, if we didn't do this, it would have at least a half order of magnitude increase in the, in the cost of a trip. So 500% increase in the cost of the trip. Um, and it would be pretty absurd to try to build a city on, on Mars um, if, you, if your spaceships just kept um, staying on Mars and not going back to Earth. You have this like massive graveyard, graveyard of ships. You have to like do something with them. Um, so it really wouldn't make sense to to, um, uh, to leave your spaceships on Mars. You really want to build a propellant plant on Mars and send the ships back. So, and Mars happens to work out well for that because it has a CO2 atmosphere, it's got water ice um, in the soil, and with H2O and CO2 you can produce CH4, methane, and oxygen O2. So picking the right propellant is also important. Um, that sort of, if you think of this as maybe there's this three main choices. Um, and they have, the, they have their merits, but um, kerosene or rocket propellant grade kerosene, which is also what uh, jets use. Uh, ro rockets use a very expensive form, a highly refined form of, of jet fuel, essentially, which is a form of kerosene. The, the, it helps keep the vehicle size small, uh, but uh, because it's, it's a very specialized form of jet fuel, it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, the uh, reusability potential is lower. Um, very difficult to make this on Mars because there's no oil. Um, so really quite difficult to make the propellant on Mars. Um, and, um, and then propellant transfer is, is, is pretty good, but not, not great. Hydrogen, although it has a high specific impulse, um, is, uh, is very expensive, incredibly difficult to, to keep from boiling off because liquid hydrogen is very close to absolute zero um, as, as a liquid. So the insulation required is, is tremendous and the, uh, um, the, the cost of, uh, the, en the energy cost on Mars of producing and storing hydrogen is very high. So when we looked at the overall system optimization, uh, it was clear to us that, um, that methane actually was the, the, the clear winner. Um, so we, um, it, it would require maybe anywhere from you know, 50 to 60% of the energy on Mars to, re to uh, 
refill propellants uh, using the, the propellant depot, and, and just the, the technical challenges are a lot easier. So, so we think we think methane is actually better on uh, you know, just really almost across the board. Um, and, and we started off initially thinking that hydrogen would make sense, but ultimately came to the conclusion that the, the best way to optimize the cost of unit mass to Mars and back um, is, is to use an all methane system, or, or technically deep cryomethalogs. So those are the four, the four elements that need to be achieved. So, this, so um, whatever, whatever uh, system is designed, uh, whether by SpaceX or, or, or anyone, we think these are the four features that need to be addressed in order for the system to, to really achieve a, a low cost per, a cost per ton to the surface of Mars. And this is a, this is a simulation of the overall system.
so what you saw there is is really uh, quite close to what we will actually build. Uh, it will look almost exactly what you saw, like what you saw. Um, so this is not 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 an artist's impression. These um, the, the simulation was actually made from the SpaceX engineering CAD models. So this is not you know it's not just well this is what it might look like. This is what we plan to try to make it look like. Um, so in, in the video, you, you, you got a sense for what the system architecture looks like. The, the rocket booster and the spaceship um, take off, loads the, the spaceship into orbit. The rocket booster then comes back. It comes back quite quickly, um, within about 20 minutes. Um, and so it, it can actually launch the, 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 the tanker version of the spacecraft, which is essentially the same as the, as the spaceship. Uh, but filling up the, the um, unpressurized and pressurized cargo areas with propellant tanks. Uh, so they look almost identical. So this, this also helps lower the, the development cost, which obviously will not be small. Um, and, uh, and then the, the propellant tanker goes up, and it'll go, actually up, it'll go up multiple times, so anywhere from three to five times to fill the tanks of the, of the spaceship in orbit. Um, and then once the, the spaceship is, the tanks are full, the cargo has been transferred, and uh, we reach the Mars rendezvous timing, which, uh, as I mentioned, is roughly every 26 months. That's when the ship would depart. Now, um, over time, there would be many spaceships. You'd ultimately have, I think, upwards of 1,000 or more spaceships waiting in orbit. And so that the Mars colonial fleet would depart en masse. Um, they're kind of like Battlestar Galactica. You've seen that thing. That's a good, good show. Um, so it, a bit like that. Um, but it, it actually makes sense to, to load the spaceships into orbit um, because you've got two years to do so, and then make frequent use of the booster and the tanker to get, get really heavy reuse out of those. And then with the, with the spaceship, you get less reuse because you have to say, well, how long is it going to last? Well, maybe 30 years. So that might be 12 to maybe 15 uh, flights of the spaceship um, at most. Um, so you really want to maximize the cargo of the spaceship um, and and, and reuse the booster and the, the, the tanker um, a, a lot. So the, the, the ship goes to Mars, gets, gets profound, replenished, um, and then returns to Earth. So I'll go into some of the details of the vehicle design and performance. And I, I'm, I'm going to gloss over, uh, or just, I'll, I'll only talk um, a little bit about the, the technical details in the actual presentation. And then I'll leave the, the detailed technical questions to the, to the Q&A that follows. This is to give you a, a sense of size. So it's quite big. And, I mean, the funny thing is, I think in the, in the long term, the strips will be even bigger than this. I, I think that th this will represent, this will be relatively small compared to the Mars um, interplanetary ships of the, of the future. Um, and, but it kind of needs to be about this size because if, if in order to, to fit 100 people or thereabouts in the pressurized section, plus carry uh, the luggage and uh, all of the unpressurized cargo to build propellant plants and build everything from um, iron foundries to pizza joints to you name it in the but we need to carry a lot of, a lot of cargo so it, it it really needs to be roughly on this on this order of magnitude because if, if we say like the the uh, say a minimum threshold for a self sustaining uh, city on Mars or civilization would be a million people well and, and you can only go every two years if you if you, um, you know, if, if you have a hundred people per ship that's 10,000 trips. So I think at least 100 people per trip is, is the right order of magnitude. And I think we actually may end up expanding the, the, the crew section and, uh, and ultimately taking more like 200 or more people per flight in order to reduce the cost per person. So but, but it's, it's, you know, 10,000 flights is, is a lot of flights. Um, so you really want ultimately, I think, on the order of 1,000 ships. It'll take a while to build up to 1,000 ships. and so I think if you say, when, when would we reach that million person threshold from the point at which the first 
go, ship goes to Mars, it's probably sort of between 20 to 50 um, total Mars rendezvous. So it's, it's, it's probably somewhere between you know, maybe 40 to 100 years uh, to achieve a, a fully self-sustaining civilization on Mars. So that's the sort of a cross section of the ship. And um, you know, in some ways, it's not that complicated, really. Um, the, uh, it's made primarily of an advanced carbon fiber. Uh, the, the carbon fiber part is tricky when dealing with uh, deep cryogens and, um, and trying to achieve uh, both liquid and gas impermeability and, have, and not have uh, gaps uh, occur uh, due to cracking or pressurization that would make the carbon fiber leaky. So this is, this is a fairly significant technical challenge to make uh, deeply cryogenic tanks out of carbon fiber. Um, and it's only recently that, uh, the, that we think that the, the carbon fiber technology um, has gotten to the point where, where we can actually do this with, without having to create a liner, on the ins uh, some sort of metal liner or other liner on the inside of the, the tanks, which would add mass and complexity. So it's particularly tricky for the hot gaseous oxygen uh, pressurization. So this, this is designed to be autogenously pressurized, which means that the, the fuel and the oxygen um, we gasify them through heat exchanges in the engine and use that to pressurize the tanks. So we'll gasify the methane and, and use that to pressurize the fuel tank, gasify the oxygen, use that to pressurize the oxygen tank. And this compares, this is a much simpler system than what we have with, with Falcon 9, where we use um, helium for pressurization and we use uh, uh, nitrogen for gas thrusters. In this case, we would autogenously pressurize and then use gaseous uh, methane and uh, oxygen for the control thrusters. So really, only, you only need two ingredients for this, as opposed to uh, four in the case of uh, Falcon 9, and actually five if you consider the ignition um, uh, liquid. Um, so we, we use it was a, 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 it, it's sort of complicated liquid to ignite the engines, that, that isn't, isn't very reusable. In this, in this case, we would use uh, spark ignition. Um, so this gives you a sense of vehicles by performance, um, sort of current and, and historic. I don't know if you can actually read that, but um, in, in expandable mode, uh, the, the, the vehicle approach that we're proposing would do about 550 tons and about 300 tons in reusable mode. Uh, that compares to Saturn V uh, max capability of, of 135 tons. Uh, but I think this, uh, this really gives a better sense for things. Um, the, the white bars show the performance of the vehicle, like in, in other words, the payload to orbit of the vehicle. So you can see essentially wh what, what it represents is what's the size efficiency of, of, the, of the vehicle. Um, and most rockets, including ours, as they're currently flying, the, the performance um, bar is only a small percentage of the actual size of the rocket. Um, but with uh, the interplanetary system, with, um, which will initially be used for Mars, um, we've been able to, um, or we believe, massively improve the design performance. So it's the first time a rocket's sort of performance bar will actually exceed the physical size of the rocket. This gives you a more direct sort of comparison. Um, this is, uh, the, the thrust level is, is quite enormous. Um, we're talking about uh, a liftoff thrust of 13,000 tons. This will be quite, quite tectonic when it takes off. Um, but it does, it does um, a fit on uh, Pad 39A, uh, which NASA has been kind enough to allow us to use, where because um, uh, they, they somewhat oversized the, the pad in doing Saturn V, and, and as a result, we can actually do a much larger vehicle on that same launch pad. And then in the future, we expect to ha add additional uh, launch locations, probably um, probably adding one in, 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 on the south coast of Texas. Uh, but this gives you a sense of the, the relative capability, if you, if you can read those. 
Um, but yeah, these vehicles have very different purposes. Uh, it, the, the, this, this is really intended to carry huge numbers of people, um, ultimately millions of tons of cargo to Mars. So you really need something quite large in order to do that. So talk about some of the key elements of the um, interplanetary interplan spaceship and rocket booster. Uh, we, we decided to start off the development uh, with uh, what we think are, are probably the two uh, most difficult elements of the of the design. One is the, the Raptor engine, um, and um, th this is going to be the, the highest chamber pressure uh, engine of any any kind ever built, and probably the highest uh, thrust to weight. Um, it's a, it's a full flow stage combustion engine, uh, which r maximizes the theoretical uh, momentum that you can get out of a, a given source fuel and, and, and oxidizer. Uh, we we subcool the oxygen and methane to densify it. So compared to uh, when it when propellants are normally used, they're used close to their boiling points in, in most rockets. In, in our case, we, we actually load the propellants close to their freezing point, and that can result in a density improvement of up to around 10 to 12 percent, which makes an enormous difference in the in the actual results of the rocket. Um, it, it also makes the it, it gets rid of any cavitation risk for the turbo pumps, and it makes it easier to feed a high pressure turbo pump if you have very cold propellant. Um, r really, one of the keys here, though, is the the uh, vacuum version of Raptor. Um, having a 382 second ISP. Th this is really quite critical to, to the whole Mars mission. Um, and we're confident we, we can get to, to that number, or at least within a few seconds of that number, ultimately maybe exceeding it slightly. So the rocket, the rocket booster, in many ways, is, is really a scaled up version of the Falcon 9 booster. Um, you'll see a lot of similarities, such as the grid fins. Um, Obviously, clustering a lot of engines at the base, and uh, the, the big difference really being that the, the primary structure is uh, an advanced form of carbon fiber as opposed to aluminum lithium, um, and that we use autogenous pressurization, um, and, um, and and we get rid of the, the helium and the, the nitrogen. So this uses 42 Raptor engines. Um, it's a lot of engines, but. Uh, we use an ion on a Falcon 9, and with Falcon Heavy, which should launch early next year, uh, there's, there's uh, 27 engines on the base. So we've got pretty good experience with having a large number of engines. It also gives us redundancy, so that if some of the engines fail, um, you can still continue the mission and be fine. Um, but the main job of, this, of the booster is to accelerate the spaceship to around um, 8,500 kilometers an hour. Um, and, uh, for, for those that are less familiar with orbital dynamics, really it's, it's all about velocity and, and not about height. Um, so that really that's the job of the, the booster. The booster is like the javelin thrower. Sort of, it's got to toss that javelin, which is the, the, the spaceship. And uh, in the case of um, other planets, though, uh, which, have, which have a gravity well which is not as deep, uh, so Mars, of the moons of Jupiter, um, conceivably one day maybe even Venus. Uh, the, the, well, Venus will be a little trickier, but um, for, for most of the solar system, uh, you only need the spaceship. So you don't, you don't need the booster if you have a lower gravity well. So no booster is needed on the moon or Mars or any of the moons of Jupiter or Pluto. Uh, you just need the spaceship. The booster is just there for heavy gravity wells. Um, and then we've, we've also been able to optimize the propellant needed for boost back and landing uh, to get it down to about 7% um, of the liftoff uh, prop propellant load. Um, we think with some optimization, maybe we can get it down to about 6%. And we've also are now getting quite comfortable with the accuracy of the landing. Um, if you've been watching the, the Falcon 9 landings, you'll see that they're getting increasingly, increasingly closer to, to the bullseye. And we think particularly with the, with the addition of additional, with addition of some uh, thrusters, some maneuvering thrusters, we can actually put the booster right back on the launch stand. And then those, those fins at the base are essentially centering features uh, to 
uh, take out any minor uh, position mismatch uh, at the lower side. So it looks like at the base. Um, so we, th we think we only need to uh, control or steer the, the center cluster of engines. So there's, there's seven engines in the center cluster. Those would be the ones that, that move for steering the rocket, and the other ones would be fixed in position, uh, which gives us the, the best concentration of, of, we can max out the number of engines because we don't have to leave any room for um, gimbling or moving the engines. And, and like I said, this is all designed so that you could actually lose multiple engines um, even at liftoff or anywhere in flights and continue the mission safely. So the, for the spaceship itself, um, in the top uh, we have the, the, the pressurized compartment. I'll show you a fly through of that in a moment. Uh, then beneath that is, the, is where we'd have the unpressurized cargo, which would be really flat packed in a very dense format. And, um, and then below that is the liquid oxygen tank. Um, the, the liquid oxygen tank is probably the hardest piece of this whole uh, vehicle because uh, it's, it's got to handle propellant at the coldest level. Um, and, it, and the tanks themselves actually form the, for, form the airframe. So the, the airframe structure and the tank structure are combined, um, as it is in, in, in all modern rockets. Um, and uh, in, in aircraft, for example, the, the, the wing is really a fuel tank in, in wing shape. Um, so the, the, um, it has to take the, 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 the thrust loads of ascent, the loads of, of reentry, um, and, um, and then it has to be impermeable to uh, gaseous oxygen, which is, which is tricky, and, and non-reactive to gaseous oxygen. So, so that's, the, that's the hardest piece of, of, the, of the spaceship itself, which is actually why we started on that element uh, as well, and I'll show you some pictures of that later. So, and then below the uh, oxygen tank is the, the fuel tank, and then the engines are mounted directly to the, the, the thrust cone on the base. Um, and then there, there, are, there are six of the vacuum, the high efficiency vacuum engines um, around the perimeter, and those, are, those, those don't gimbal. And, and then there are three of the sea level versions of the engine which uh, do gimbal and provide the steering. Although we can do uh, some, some amount of steering if you're in space by with differential thrust on the uh, outside engines. Uh, the net effect is uh, a cargo to um, Mars of, of up to 450 tons depending upon how many um, uh, refills you do with the, the, the tanker. And the goal is at least 100 passengers per ship, although I think ultimately we'll probably see that number grow to 200 or more. Uh, this, this chart's a little difficult to interpret at first, but I, I kind of, we decided to put it there for people who want to watch the video afterwards and, and sort of take a closer look uh, and analyze some of the numbers. Um, the, the, the column on the left is probably what's most relevant, um, and that's, that gives you the trip time. So depending upon which uh, Earth Mars rendezvous you're aiming for, the trip time um, at six kil kilometers per second departure velocity can be as low as 80 days. Um, and then over time, I think we'd obviously improve that, um, and um, ultimately I suspect um, that you'd, you'd see Mars transit times of as little as 30 days in, in the more distant future. So it's, it's fairly manageable considering the trips that people used to do in the old days that routinely take uh, sailing voyages that would be six months or more. So on arrival, the, the heat shield technology is, is, is extremely important. Um, we've been refining the, the heat shield technology using our Dragon spacecraft. Um, and we now have, uh, we're now on version three of uh, PICA, which is phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. Um, and it's getting more and more robust with each new version, um, with, with less ablation, more resistance, um, less need for refurbishment. The heat shield's basically a giant brake pad. So it's like, how good can you make that brake pad against extreme reentry conditions and minimize the, the, the cost of refurbishment um, and, and make it so that you could have many flights with no refurbishment at all? So this is a flight through of the, the crew compartment.
I want to give you a sense of what it would feel like to, to actually be in the spaceship. Um, I mean, in order to make it appealing um, and, and increase that portion of the Venn diagram where people actually want to go, um, it's got to be really fun and exciting, um, and it, it can't feel cramped or, um, or boring. So uh, the, the, crew, the crew compartment or the occupant compartment is set up so that you can do zero-G games, you can float around, uh, there'll be like movies, uh, lecture halls, um, you know, cabins, um, a restaurant. It'll be like really fun to go. You're gonna have a great time. <laughs> so for the, the propellant plant on Mars, um, again, this is one of those slides that um, I, I won't go into in, in, in detail here, but people can think about uh, offline. The, the key point being that the ingredients are there on Mars to uh, create a propellant plant with relative ease. Because the, the atmosphere is primarily CO2 um, and there's water ice almost everywhere, you've got the, the CO2 plus H2O to make methane CH4 and oxygen O2 um, using the Sabatier reaction. Um, the, 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 the trickiest thing really is the, the energy source, which we think we can do with a large field of, of, of uh, solar panels. Uh, so then to give you a sense of the cost, really, really the key is, uh, is making this affordable to uh, almost anyone who wants to go. And we think um, based on this architecture, um, this architecture assuming optimization over time, like the very first flights wouldn't be, would be fairly expensive, but the architecture allows for a cost per ticket um, of less than $200,000. Maybe as less, maybe as little as $100,000 um, over time, depending upon how much mass a person takes. So we're right now um, estimating about $140,000 per ton to the surface of Mars. So if a person plus the luggage is less than that, um, taking into account food consumption um, and life support, then uh, we, we think that the, the cost of, a, of moving to Mars ultimately could drop below $100,000. So funding, these are our, we thought about funding sources. <laughs> and um, so we've got steel underpants, uh, launch satellites, uh, send cargo to space station, Kickstarter, of course, um, followed by profit. So the, uh, obviously it's gonna be a challenge to, to fund this, this whole endeavor. Um, uh, we, we do expect to generate um, pretty decent uh, net, net cash flow from launching lots of satellites and servicing the space station from NASA, transferring cargo to and from the space station. Um, and, um, and then uh, I know that there's, there's a lot of people in, in the private sector who are interested in helping fund a, a base on Mars. Um, and then perhaps there'll be uh, interest on, on, on the government sector side to also do that. Um, ultimately, this is going to be uh, a huge uh, public-private partnership, um, and I think that's 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 how um, the United States was established, um, and uh, many other countries around the world is a public-private partnership. So I think that's probably what what occurs. And right now, we're just trying to make as much progress as we can with the resources that that we have available, um, and just sort of keep keep moving ball forward, um, and hopefully. Um, I think, I think as, we, as we show that this is possible, that this dream is real, um, not just a dream, it can, it can, it's something that can be made real, um, I think the support will snowball over time. Um, and I should say also that um, the, the main reason I'm personally accumulating assets is in order to fund this. So I, I really don't have any other motivation for personally accumulating assets uh, except to be able to make the the biggest contribution I can to um, making life multiplanetary. <laughs> Timelines. Not the best at this sort of thing. <laughs> but. Um, just to show you where we started off, um, in 2002, SpaceX basically consisted of 
carpet and a mariachi band. <laughs> that, that was it. That's, that's, that's all of SpaceX in 2002. Um, as you can see, I'm a dancing machine. Um, and uh, yeah, I believe in kicking off Silver Tree events with mariachi bands. I really like mariachi bands. <laughs> so, um, but but that, that, that was what we started off with in 2002. Um, and, and really, I, I mean, I thought we had maybe a 10% chance of, of, of doing anything, um, of even getting a rocket to orbit, let alone getting beyond that and, and, and taking Mars uh, seriously. Uh, but um, I, I came to the conclusion that if, 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 there were, if there wasn't some new entrant into, um, in, into the space arena um, w with a strong ideological motivation, uh, then it, it didn't seem like we were on a trajectory to ever <laughs> Uh, be a space bearing civilization and, and be out there among the stars. Um, because, you know, in 69 we were able to go to the moon and the space shuttle could get to low Earth orbit and then obviously the space shuttle got retired, but, but that trend line is down, down to zero. So um, I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is that technology does not automatically improve. It, it, it only improves if, if a lot of really strong engineering talent um, a, a, is applied to the problem. Um, th that it improves. Um, and there are many examples in history where civilizations have reached a certain technology level and then ha have fallen well below that and, and, um, and then re recovered only millennia later. So we go from 2002, uh, where we're basically we're, we're clueless, um, and then and, and developed with Falcon 1. The, the smallest useful orbital rocket that we could think of, which would deliver half a ton to orbit. Um, and then four years later, we developed the, um, and built the, the, first, the first vehicle. So we developed the main engine, the upper stage engine, the, the, the airframes, the fairing, and, and the, the launch system. And had our first attempted at launch in 2006, uh, which failed. <laughs> so that, that lasted about 60 seconds, unfortunately. Um, uh, but, but, 2006, uh, four years after starting, is also when we, we actually got our, our first uh, NASA contract. Um, and I just want to say I'm in incredibly grateful to NASA for supporting SpaceX, um, you know, despite the fact that our rocket crashed. Um, it was awesome. I, I, I'm NASA's biggest fan. Um, so, yeah, thank, thank you very much to the people that had the faith to do that. Thank you. So then, um, 2006, uh, followed by a lot of grief, um, and then uh, finally the fourth launch of Falcon 1 uh, worked in 2008, and we were re really down to our last pennies. Uh, in fact, I only thought I had enough money for three launches, and the first three bloody failed, um, and uh, we were able to scrape together enough to just barely make it and do, do a fourth launch, um, and that, thank, thank goodness that uh, fourth launch succeeded um, in 2008. Um, that was a lot of pain. And, uh, and then also at the end of 2008 is when, when NASA awarded us the first, the first major uh, operational contract, uh, which was for resupplying cargo uh, to the space station and bringing cargo back. Um, then a couple of years later, we did the first launch of uh, Falcon 9, uh, version 1. Um, and that had about a, a, a 10 ton to uh, orbit capability, so it was about 20 times the capability of Falcon 1, um, and also was assigned to, to carry our Dragon spacecraft. Um, then 20, 2010 is uh, our first uh, uh, mission to the space station, so we were able to, to uh, finish development of Dragon and uh, dock with the space station in 2010. Um, so, uh, sorry, 20, sorry, 2010 is expendable, expendable Dragon, expendable Dragon. 2012 is when we uh, delivered and returned cargo from the space station. Uh, 2013 is when we first started doing a vertical takeoff and landing tests. Um, and then 2014 is when um, we were able to have the first orbital booster do a soft landing in the ocean. The landing was soft, uh, that fell over and exploded, but um, the landing for seven seconds, it was good. <laughs> um, and we also improved the capability of the vehicle uh, from uh, 10 tons to about uh, um, 13 tons to Leo. 
Um, and then 2015, or last year, uh, in December, uh, that was definitely one of the best moments of my life when the Rocket Booster came back and landed at, at Cape Canaveral. Um, so that was really, yeah. Kind of, So I think, I think that, that really showed that we could bring um, an orbit-class booster back from a very high velocity um, all the way to um, the launch site um, and land it safely um, and, um, and, and with, with almost no refurbishment required for reflight. And if, if things go well, we're, we're hoping to uh, refly one of the landed boosters in a, in a few months. Um, so yeah, and then 2016, we also demonstrated landing on, on a ship. Um, the landing on the ship is important for the very high velocity geosynchronous missions, um, and um, that's that's important for usability of, of uh, Falcon 9 because um, about uh, you know, roughly a quarter of our missions are are, are sort, of, sort of servicing the space station, um, and then there's a few other low Earth orbit missions, but most of our missions, probably 60% you know, of our missions, are commercial geo missions. So. Uh, we've got to do these high velocity missions that really need to uh, land on a ship out to sea. They don't have enough uh, propellants on board to boost back to the, the launch site. So looking into the future, uh, next steps. Um, we were kind of intentionally a bit fuzzy about this timeline. <laughs> um, but the, we're, going to, we're going to try to make as much progress as we can. Obviously it's with a very constrained budget, um, but we're going to try to make as much progress as we can on the, uh, the elements of the interplanetary transport uh, booster and spaceship, um, and, uh, and and hopefully we'll be able to do to complete the first um, uh, development uh, spaceship in maybe about four years, and start doing um, suborbital flights with with that. Uh, in fact, it actually has enough capability that you could maybe even go to orbit uh, with, if you limit the amount of cargo with the spaceship. Uh, but, well, you have, to really, you have to really strip it down, but in, in, in tanker form, it can definitely get to orbit. Um, can't get back, <laughs> we can get to orbit. Um, uh, it actually starts thinking like, maybe there is some market for really fast transport of stuff around the world, um, provided we can land somewhere where noise is not a super big deal. Um, the rockets are very noisy, uh, but we, we, we could transport cargo to anywhere on Earth um, in 45 minutes, at the, at the longest. So most places on Earth would be maybe 20, 25 minutes. So um, you know, maybe if we had a floating platform out off the coast of, um, you know, say uh, off the coast of New York, uh, say 20, 30 miles out, you could go from um, you know, New York to Tokyo in, I don't know, 25 minutes. Um, across the Atlantic in 10 minutes. As, um, really, most of your time would be getting to the ship. Um, and then there'd be real quick after that. So there's some, some intriguing possibilities there, um, although we're not, we're not counting on that. And then, uh, and then development of the booster. We actually think the booster part is, is relatively straightforward because we've it, it's, it amounts to um, a scaling up of the Falcon 9 booster. Um, so there's, we don't see a lot of sort of showstoppers there. Um, yeah, so, so then, but then trying to put it all together um, and, 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 and make this actually work for Mars. If, if things go super well, it might be kind of in the 10 year time frame. Um, but um, that there's, there's a, I, I don't want to say that's when, when it will occur. It's like there's a huge amount of risk. Um, it's it's going to cost a lot. Um, good chance we don't succeed, but we're, we're going to do our best um, and, and try to make as much progress as, as possible. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and we're going to try to send something to Mars on every Mars rendezvous from here on out. So. Uh, Dragon 2, which is a propulsive lander, uh, we plan to send to Mars in, um, in, in a couple of years. And, uh, and then do probably another Dragon mission in 2020. In fact, we want to, 
establish a steady cadence that there's always uh, a flight leaving, like a train leaving the station. Um, with every Mars rendezvous, we will be trans we will be sending a dragon, at least a dragon to Mars, and ultimately the big spaceship. So, if there are people that are interested in putting payloads on on Dragon, um, you know you can count on uh, a ship that's going to transport something on the order of, of um, at least uh, two or three tons of useful payload to the surface of Mars. Yeah, so that's, that, that's part of the reason why we designed Dragon 2 to be a propulsive lander, is as a propulsive lander, you can, you can go anywhere in the solar system. Um, so you could go to the moon, you could go to, well, anywhere, really. Um, whereas uh, if something relies on parachutes or wings, um, then you can pretty much only, well, if it's, if it's uh, wings, you can pretty much only land on Earth because you need a runway, and most places don't have a runway. Um, and then any place that doesn't have a dense atmosphere, you can't use parachutes. So, but propulsive works um, anywhere. So, so Dragon should be capable of landing on any uh, solid or liquid surface in the, in the solar system. Um, and then I was, I was really excited to see that uh, the team managed to uh, do the uh, all-up uh, Raptor engine firing in advance of this uh, conference. Um, the, the, I just want to say thanks to, to the Raptor team uh, for really working seven days a week to try to get this done uh, in advance of the, of the presentation. Um, so I, I really want to show that we've made some hardware progress in this direction. And, um, and, and the, the Raptor is a really tricky engine. It's, it's a lot trickier than, than Molin uh, because it's a full flow stage combustion, much higher pressure. Um, and um, I'm kind of amazed it didn't blow up on the, on the first firing, uh, but it, fortunately it, it, was, uh, it was good. It's kind of interesting to see the mock diamonds forming. Um, yeah. So the um, it, it part, and, and part of the reason for making the engine sort of small, like Raptor, although it has three times the thrust of a Merlin, um, is actually only about the same size as a Merlin engine because it has three times the operating pressure, um, and that means we can use a lot of the production techniques that we've honed with Merlin. We're currently producing Merlin engines at uh, almost 300 per year. So we understand how to make uh, rocket engines in volume. Uh, so even though the, the Mars vehicle uses 42 on the base and nine on the upper stage, um, so we're 51 engines to, to make, um, that, that's well within our production capabilities for Merlin. Um, and this is a similarly, similarly sized engine to Merlin, ex except for the expansion ratio. Um, so we feel really comfortable about being able to make this engine in volume at, uh, at, at a price that doesn't, doesn't break our budget. Um, and then uh, we also wanted to make progress on the primary structure. So um, as I mentioned, this, this is really qu a very difficult um, thing to make, uh, is, is to make something out of carbon fiber. Even though carbon fiber has incredible strength to weight, um, when, when you want, want to then put um, uh, super uh, cold liquid oxygen and liquid methane, particularly particular liquid oxygen, in, in the tank, um, it's subject to, to cracking um, and leaking, um, and it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing to make. It just the sheer scale of it is, is also challenging because you've, you've got to lay up the carbon fiber in exactly the right way on a huge mold, and you've got to cure that mold at temperature, um, and, uh, and then, it's, 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 and then it's, it's just really hard to make large, large carbon fiber structures that, that can do all of those things and carry incredible loads. Um, so, so that's, that's the other thing we wanted to focus on was the Raptor and then building the first uh, uh, development tank for the Mars spaceship. So, um, yeah, like I said, this, 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 is the, this is really the hardest part of the, of the spaceship. The other pieces are, 
we, um, we have a pretty good handle on, but this was the, the trickiest one. So we wanted to tackle it first. You get a size for how big the tank is. Um, it's really, really quite big. Um, also, big congratulations to the team uh, that worked on that. They also were working seven days a week to, to try to get this done uh, in advance of the IAC. Um, and um, so that we managed to build the first tank. Um, and uh, the initial tests with the cryogenic propellant actually look quite, quite positive. We've, we have not seen um, any leaks or, or major issues. This is what the, the tank looks like on, on the inside. So you can get a, get a real sense for how much, just how big this, this, this tank is. Um, the, it, it's actually completely smooth on the inside, but the way that the carbon fiber plies lay up and reflect the light makes it look, look faceted. So then what about uh, Beyond Mars? So as we thought about the system, and the reason we call it a system, because generally I don't like calling things systems because everything's a system, including your dog. Um, the, is, that, um, is that it's actually more than a vehicle. Um, there's, there's obviously the rocket booster, the spaceship, uh, the tanker, and the propellant uh, plant, the, um, the in-situ propellant production. Um, if you have all of those four elements, um, you, you can actually go anywhere in the solar system by, by, by planet hopping or, or moon hopping. So by establishing a propellant depot on in the asteroid belt or on one of the moons of Jupiter, um, you can go to you can make flights uh, from uh, Mars to Jupiter no problem. Uh, in fact, even from even without a propellant depot at Mars, you can you can do a flyby of of Jupiter uh, without a propellant depot. Um, so, but, but by establishing a propellant depot, um, uh, let's say you know. Enceladus or Europa or, or any of this, a few, few options. Um, and then doing another one on Titan, uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn's moon, um, and then perhaps another one uh, further out um, on Pluto uh, or elsewhere in the solar system. Um, th this system really gives, gives you freedom to go anywhere you want in the greater solar system. So you can actually travel out to the Kuiper Belt, to the Earth Cloud. Um, I wouldn't recommend this for um, interstellar journeys, but uh, this, uh, this, this basic system, provided we have filling stations along the way, um, is, means full access to the entire greater solar system. It would be really great to do a mission to Europa, particularly. So. All right, so uh, any, any questions that I can answer?